talking about the intro to viruses. We've spent some time talking about the general structure of viruses. Let's move on and talk, spend some time talking about how viruses can reproduce. Now, if we think of a virus as an obligate intracellular parasite, they must be inside of a host cell, the host machinery. That's what that word, obligate intracellular parasite, means. Actually, that phrase. So if we look at the viral replication cycle, it dictates, or its very essence, is going to involve the infection of the cell, and it's going to involve retaking over the cell. So if we look at the way the virus is transmitted, that's going to impact its life cycle, what the host cell does in response to the virus, and there are mechanisms in place for the host cell to fight out the virus, both within the cell itself, and then the host cell has mechanisms for self-destructing if it can't fight out the virus, so there are immune responses or immune defenses, and then finally, what do we as humans do to help control viral infections? All of these things are, will impact the life cycle of the virus. The general phases of a virus that infects an animal cell, I want to emphasize animal cell viral replication. I'm not talking about bacterial viral replication. We'll talk about that next. Right now we're talking about animal viral replication. It has these steps. It's a six-step plan. First, we need to have absorption, penetration, uncoating, synthesis, assembly, and release. One, two, three, four, five, six. Good, that, that six. Good. I can count still. Now, this replication cycle can vary in time. Sometimes it's really, really quick and up to, as short as eight hours. Or it can be really, really long, as long as 36 hours. Some things that influence this cycle include how complicated the virus is. Um, more complicated viruses, generally speaking, take longer for the synthesis and assembly portions. Um, also, if it has positive sense RNA versus single or negative sense RNA, um, that, that if it's negative sense RNA, there's going to be an extra step involved in replicating its DNA. Um, compared to the positive sense RNA viruses. So let's look at step number one, absorption. We need to get the viron particle into the host cell. So we have absorption where it binds to the extracellular matrix of the host cell. That spike that sticks out from the virus, the receptors on the virus make contact kind of like a lock and key model that describes enzymes and their substrates. There's a specific receptor on the virus that matches a specific receptor on the host cell that cause them to link together. The range of cells that a virus can infect is called the host range, and that's going to be influenced by the receptors on the surface of the virus and the receptors on the surface of the host cell. Classic examples are hepatitis viruses, hep V, B, which only can affect liver cells in humans, polio virus, which can only in affect intestinal or nerve cells in a, the class of primates, or the rabies virus, which can infect any cell in any mammal. Or I shouldn't say any cell. It can infect a wide variety of cells in any mammal. If the cell doesn't have the right receptor on its surface, the viron particle is not going to be able to absorb. The cell will be resistant to that viron particle. It's been found that some people, some small subtypes of people, subgroupings or demographics of people, naturally don't have the correct receptors for the HIV particle or um, to, excuse me, AIDS, HIV leads to AIDS. Yes, the HIV for HIV to get into the cell. And those people are naturally resistant to HIV because the HIV can never go through the first step, absorption, and get into their cells. Now, if we look for at a specific virus that can get into a specific tissue, that's going to be called a tropism. And these are going to be the characteristics of the viruses, specific viruses that can get into specific tissues. So if the virus has the right tropism, it can get into your target cell type, your target tissue type. If the virus is lacking that tropism, it cannot get in. Here's an example of a enveloped virus that has some spike sticking out that bound with receptors on the host cell membrane. We have connection, so we have that absorption taking place, and we're starting our next step, the penetration. That flexible cell membrane is going to invaginate or allow the whole virus or the nucleic acids of the virus to enter in. Um, if we have penetration through endocytosis or the invagination in of the cell membrane, the entire virus will be engulfed and swallowed by the cell and brought in to a transport vesicle or vacuole. Direct penetration is going to be a little bit quicker. In those situations, the viral envelope, and if there's an envelope, remember the virus is going to be covered with phospholipids. The phospholipids that make up the envelope of the virus will fuse directly with the phospholipids of 
the cell membrane and directly dump its contents into the cell. If we have uncoating, our enzymes in the vacuole dissolve the envelope and capsid, and our virus will then fuse with the walls of the vesicle, and our viral nucleic acids will be released directly into the cytoplasm. So during this uncoating phase, essentially the virus will incorporate this, the vacuole with its own envelope so that it can start to release its genetic information into the host cytoplasm. So here we can see a viron particle binding. So we have attachment. Here we can have the absorption or the engulfment. And then the viron particle releases its genetic information. Here on this other side, instead of having endocytosis, we're going to have the viron particle merging with the cell membrane and dumping its genetic information into the cell. Our next step is synthesis. We need to make our particles, our subunits, to make up the next virus. Our DNA-based viruses can get into the host cell nucleus and are replicated and assembled there. So our DNA-based viruses will send their genetic information, their DNA, into our animal cell or host cell's nucleus, where it can then affect the nuclear genome. Our RNA-based viruses, generally speaking, don't need to bother with the, the nucleus. Instead, they can go directly to the ribosomes that are floating in the cytoplasm. If we're dealing with a retrovirus, our retroviruses, um, and retro meaning for backwards or retrograde, are going to, to take their RNA, turn it into DNA, and then incorporate that DNA into the host cell nuclear genome. So let's talk about double-stranded DSDNA viruses. These are, generally speaking, the more stable and better understood viruses. But during the early stage, we'll have the viral DNA enter the host cell's nucleus, and its genes, the viral genes, are going to be transcribed. Remember, we have transcription and then translation. They'll be transcribed into messenger RNA or mRNA. This mRNA is then going to move through the nuclear pores into the cytoplasm, and there it'll bind to ribosomes to be translated into viral proteins that we need to make more viral DNA. The host cell DNA polymerase, typically going to be DNA polymerase 3, is going to be involved in this stage, or in this phase, where we take viral DNA and turn it into viral RNA. During the late phase of this cycle, they'll have parts of the viral genome translated into proteins that can form our capsid or other structures of the, the virus, the viron particle, and our new viral genome and capsids are assembled within the cytoplasm of the cell. Mature viruses that are fully assembled will typically conglomerate together and then be released via budding from the cell membrane. And if they are released via budding, generally speaking, this process is going to envelope the virus with phospholipids. So if we have a virus ever released by budding, that's a big clue for you that there's going, it's going to be an enveloped virus with phospholipids around its outside, outer coating or outside perimeter. So we were talked about our double-stranded. We just finished talking about our double-stranded DNA-based viruses. Let's talk about RNA-based viruses. There's a lot. There's a lot more variation in our RNA-based viruses. Here we have four different modes of um, for RNA-based viruses, whereas we have just two different modes for our DNA-based viruses. Oops, there we go. So if we have a double-stranded virus, DNA-based virus, we go from double-stranded DNA to the messenger RNA to the protein. So it's going to be very, very similar to what we already do normally in our cells. If we have a positive sense single-stranded DNA-based virus, that positive sense DNA-based virus is going to be um, synthesized into double-stranded DNA, and that double-stranded DNA will go to messenger RNA and then positive sense DNA. And whenever we get to the messenger RNA state, we are going to, boom, make a protein out of it. Now, if we have positive sense RNA, remember positive sense means it's directly able to be translated. We can have a ribosome bind to it. If we have positive sense RNA, that positive sense RNA can be immediately turned into a viral protein. That positive sense RNA is also going to be turned into negative sense, which can go back to positive sense, and then to a protein. If we have negative sense RNA, it must be converted to positive sense RNA before we can get our proteins. Positive double-stranded DNA can go directly to protein, and then if we have a retrovirus, we go from the RNA 
back to DNA, and then from DNA back to RNA, and then to the proteins. After we make all of our subunits for our virus, we need to put them together. This putting together the parts process is known as the assembly stage. And it's just as simple as it sounds. Assembly is connecting the parts, assembling the virus inside of the cytoplasm of the infected host cell. The release stage is when we have the viron particles sent into the extracellular environment. The release stage from the infected cell is controlled by the size of the virus and the health of the host cell. If we have a pox virus infected cells, it's going to be capable of releasing 3,000 to 4,000 viron particles. A poliovirus infected cell, poliovirus being um, a slightly smaller viron particle, can release 100,000 virons. There, and if one virus can infect a cell and then cause thousands of other viruses to be produced, there is going to be rapid proliferation, rapid reproduction of the virus, and rapid spreading of this viral-based pathogen throughout the host organism. So here we can see during the assembly stage and the release stage, we can have the subunits, those protein subunits making up the capsid, wrapping around the RNA or the genetic information. Now we have a viral nucleocapsid. That viral nucleocapsid will then bind to proteins on the intracellular side of the cell membrane, and the cell membrane buds out. And then we have a, a viron particle with an envelope. Forming. This is a nice, easy to understand figure. Here we have an electron micrograph that's been artificially colored, showing the exact same process. Hmm, good coffee. Where was I? All right, so here's a wonderful summary slide from your textbook. We have the virus binding with absorption, then we have penetration here. Here we have uncoding where it releases this information, genetic information. Here we have synthesis where it's making new subunits, assembly where the new viron is made and then release where the new viron is sent away to infect other cells within the host organism. So as we can imagine, viruses hijacking the machinery of the host cell and making the host cell do something other than what it was designed to do is bad for the host cell. It causes damage to the host cell. These are, this damage is known as a cytopathic effect. Cyto is a prefix meaning cell, pathic meaning disease. So cytopathic is a cell disease effect. These virus-induced damages to the cell or cytopathic effects alter the microscopic appearance of the cell. As we are changing the functions of the cell, the cell is going to change its form. It will look physically different. So we'll see a change in the shape and the size of the cell. Sometimes we'll see intracellular changes. We'll see some inclusion bodies. If I go back two slides here, here are some inclusion bodies that are forming within this hijacked host cell. Every now and again, you'll see multiple host cells that have been affected merge together. So if you're looking, let's say, at some nervous tissue and you see nervous cells within the nervous tissue that have two or three nuclei within them, that's going to be a big red flag that you've had infected cells fuse together to form a syncytia. These cells are going to be very large cells and they're going to have multiple nuclei in them. Now, sometimes we have multinucleate cells in animals as part of just the general course of development. A classic example is skeletal muscle fibers or skeletal muscle cells. Those are normally supposed to be multinucleated cells, but that's the exception to the trend. Generally speaking, within animals, we have mononucleate or single nucleated cells. As we have more and more individual cells get in, um, damaged by the viruses, that damage will accumulate in the tissue and eventually kill the organism, if not contained, if left unchecked. Sometimes we'll have a persistent infection from the virus. The cell is going to be harboring the virus, and the virus takes its time going through its life cycle of reproduction of making more viron particles and releasing them into the extracellular environment. These viruses can remain dormant, so to speak, for weeks or for the entire life cycle of the host. These can, sometimes these viruses can remain in the cytoplasm the, the entire life cycle of the host. Other times these viruses can remain dormant by incorporating their DNA into the nuclear genome of the host and waiting there. 
if we have a provirus, that provirus specifically is a kind of virus that will incorporate DNA into the host nuclear genome. A classic example of this is the measles virus. Another good example of this is actually the chickenpox virus or varicella. We can also have a chronic latent state virus. These l chronic latent state viral infections are going to become periodically activated under various stimuli. So if we take a provirus and we stimulate that provirus to start re actively reproducing or becoming an activated viron particle, that's going to be a chronic latent state virus stage. Um, this gen the general term for incorporating the DNA into the or the nucleic acids into the host genome is called latent stage. Another good example of this is going back to chickenpox. If somebody's been actually infected with chickenpox, um, they can have that chickenpox nuclear information incorporated in their genomes, and then later on in life, it can become activated and it will manifest itself as shingles. Another good example is the herpes zoster viruses and the herpes simplex viruses. These viruses can be activated and deactivated multiple times over the life cycle of the organism or as of the human being. This will manifest itself as cold sores that will reappear every couple months, every couple years on an infected person. Once somebody is infected with these viruses, we are unable to completely remove all of the viral genetic information from the host genome. So going back to chickenpox as an example, if an individual is vaccinated against chickenpox, they never have an opportunity to become fully infected with chickenpox and won't have a risk factor for developing shingles later on in life. But if your parents were old school and took you to a chickenpox party as a little kid and intentionally got you infected with the actual chickenpox virus, then you have bits of chickenpox DNA in your own nuclear genomes and you have a chance of developing shingles later on in life. These changes to our nuclear genome obviously are going to mess with the machinery of the cell the long term and have long term implications for cellular reproduction. It's estimated that these changes can cause approximately 20% of all cancers. This transformation is going to be known as the effect of an onconic or cancer causing virus on the cell. Transformation is more of a generic term in genetics that means taking genetic information from one organism and in mixing it or in inserting it into a separate or different organism or different species more specifically. So if we take a virus particle or viron particle and take its genetic information and incorporate it into a host cell, we've transformed the host cell. Many times this is transformation process is going to affect onconic genes or cancer causing genes. And this can be done by cancer causing viruses. These cancer-causing viruses sometimes will directly carry genes that are directly linked to causing cancers. Other times the virus are going to make proteins that are going to induce a loss of regulation that can lead to the cancerous state. These transformed cells that have the onconic genes incorporated in them or the iconic proteins incorporated in them are generally speaking going to grow really fast. They have an increased rate of growth. This is going to be at the pre-tumor state or pre-cancerous state. They're going to have alterations of the chromosomes. That goes without saying. If we change the genetic information, we are going to change the pieces of DNA in the cell, the chromosomes in the cells. As we change the genetic information or the blueprints to make the cell, the cell itself is going to have different surface molecule molecules expressed on its surface, and this will eventually lead to cells that have the ability to divide indefinitely unchecked. And once they get to that stage, they are known as malignant cells. There are several onconoviruses or cancer-causing viruses that are capable of causing tumors or cancer within the class of mam class mammals or mammalia. Those can include the papillomammoviruses, the herpes virus, the hepatitis B virus, and the human T lymphocyte virus number one or HTLV1. So here's a nice figure summarizing what I talked about in the last several slides. We can have a retrovirus take its DNA and incorporate it into the host genome and that change as it gets 
mutates the host genome is going to mutate the host genome in such a way that we have um, uncontrolled cell growth and cancer. Or we can have a, a, a different retrovirus take its viral DNA and incorporate it into the host genome and then that viral DNA will directly start making cancer causing proteins. Or we can have the host genome We'll take that viral DNA and just put it directly in the nucleus of the host, and then that viral DNA, well, it's directly in the nucleus of the host, not necessarily incorporated into the host genome, can then directly start making viral proteins. So we can either cause a mutation that will cause cancer, we can incorporate cancer-causing nucleic acids into the nuclear genome, or we can just directly incorporate double-stranded viral DNA into the nuclear the nucleus of the cell and then start translating and tra transcribing and translating it to make cancer causing proteins. So those were viruses that infected animals. Now let's talk about viruses that infect bacterial cells or prokaryotic cells. A bacteriophage means quite literally bacteria eating virus or back it's a virus that will affect or attack bacteria exclusively. These bacteriophages almost always are going to contain double-stranded DNA. Every once in a while, there'll be an RNA-based bacteriophage, but they're the exception. Our bacterial species are going to be parasized by a very specific bacteriophage. Every bacterial species has a bacteriophage that attacks it. That's a good thing. It keeps the amount of bacteria on our planet in check. These bacteria that infect, become infected by a bacteriophage can sometimes become more pathogenic or it can become more dangerous to the host organisms that are infected by the bacteria. So we can take a strain of E. coli that's normally not infectious to human beings or pathogenic to human beings, infect it with a bacteriophage, and then all of a sudden that, bac that E. coli strain becomes pathogenic to human beings. This happens as the bacteriophage makes alterations to the bacterial genome and causes there to be changes in the structures and functions of that bacterial cell. So let's talk about the T. even bacteriophage, which is one of the best understood ones because it infects one of the best understood bacteria, Escherichia coli. It has an ocycohedral capsid, so it has a 20-sided capsid that contains double-stranded DNA, There'll be a central tube in it surrounded by a sheath with a collar and a base plate, and then attached to that are tail pins with fibers for binding. So here's our 20-sided capsid. Here's our tail and our base plate. And then we have the DNA that can be injected directly into the cytoplasm of the host bacterium. You could think of this form of bacteriophage as a glorified hypodermic needle that's designed to inject its genetic information into the host bacterium. <coughs> so if we look at the stages of bacteriophage reproduction, we have first stage one, absorption, stage two, penetration, stage three, duplication of the components, stage four, assembly of new components, stage five maturation where the new components are fully assembled and then stage six the cell will lyse and release new bacteriophages into the extracellular environment and the process repeats itself all over again now that's going to be for active viron particles or our virus can enter the latent stage or the lysogenic state where instead of actively reproducing its genetic information and instead takes its genetic information and incorporates it into the viral, excuse me, the bacterial genome, where the viral DNA and the bacterial DNA merge and remain combined. Lysogeny is sometimes referred to as the silent viral or virus infection, and it has a temperate phage. These temperate phages undergo absorption and penetration so they're able to bind to the bacterial cell and inject their genetic information into the bacterial cell but they don't immediately go through the replication stages instead their viral DNA is going to be um, 
incorporated into the bacterial genome will go to the prophage state and that is go that as the bacterial will reproduce will have reproducing the bacterial will reproduce the viral genome along with its own genome lysogeny is the state of the host chromosome carrying viral dna so if a, a cell's been infected with a virus but the cell is not actively reproducing viruses that cell is probably going to be in the lys lysogeny state where it's actively carrying viral dna in its host um, genomes if we expose that cell typically to stressful situations, we can initiate induction. Induction is when we leave the lysogenic state, or, and the cell will activate the viruses and immediately start viral reproduction. Every now and again, the phage genes, so those bacteriophage genes that we incorporate into the bacterial chromosomes, can cause the production of toxins or enzymes that make human six that cause pathology in human beings. This is known as a lysogenic conversion when this happens. When the bacterium requires a new trait from the temperate phage, the phage that can infect it. For example, if we look at Cornybacterium diphtheria, Cornybacterium diphtheria sometimes produces the diphtheria toxin, sometimes it doesn't. That is a lysogenic conversion when it goes from the pathogenic to non-pathogenic state. If we look at Vibrio cholerae, if it's producing the cholera toxin versus not producing the cholera toxin, again, a lysogenic conversion. Another one is Clostridium botulinum. Um, we can go through a lysogenic conversion where it will go from non-pathogenic to pathogenic and start producing the botulism toxin. So, Let's have a concept check. Put the phases of the life cycle of animal viruses in the correct order. They are assembly, penetration, release, absorption, synthesis, and uncoding. If you do not remember the answer, you can flip back in your PowerPoint, rewind the video, or check your textbook. All right, let's pause the video. All right, if you flip back in your PowerPoint slides, or rewound the text, or rewound the video. You can see that step one is absorption, then we have penetration, then encoding, then synthesis, a replication, then we have assembly, and then we have release. And that was your answer for your concept check question. If you have any other questions, shoot me an email, post them on the discussion board. Happy studies.